for us, how God is working all things together. And I want you to notice as we read this, when you come to those words, these things, all things, you're going to see something pretty amazing. And we're actually going to begin in verse 26, and then I will seek to conclude this study this night. You know, we live in a weird, wired world. I am not a part of the digital generation. I have to confess that as an old guy, I went through my entire education all the way from kindergarten through the doctoral program with no access to a computer. Are there any witnesses and testimonies? I think you know what I'm talking about. And as a result of that, it's all very strange to me. I was reading a study not long ago from uh, the Wall Street Journal about how the age groups are so different in their shopping and how basically when it comes down to uh, shopping, those of my age group tend to go to stores, uh, we go to malls, we go to strip centers, we go to Sam's and Walmart and so forth and so forth. But millennials love to shop online. They love to talk to their friends about a product. They love to check something out and order it online. And they are called digital natives. Digital natives. And only one in five can go more than an hour without checking their cellular device. One in five can go more than an hour without checking their cell phone. We have an overload of data in our world. We have maximum connection in many ways. You have people talking about my friends. He friended me. She friended me. They defriended me. We have a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He is your BFF, your best friend forever the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at the work of God and His purpose for us. Would you stand as we honor the reading of God's inerrant Word? Romans 8, verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Holy Spirit, the Spirit Himself, intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him Freely give us all things. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And God's people said, amen, amen and amen. You may be seated. 
We can never learn enough of God's desire to connect with us, his people. And yet there is a strange sense that people have, even children of God, that God is somehow absent and not active in their lives. We have seen that he is at work, and God says that I, I am so, I love you so much, I'm going to use every single piece of raw material in your life to conform you to the image of Christ. Old Jacob, uh, stung by the disappearance of his son and what he thought was the death of Joseph by a wild animal, said, all these things are against me. It's one of the most negative statements in the Old Testament. All these things are against us, many would say. David said at one uh, depth point in his life when he was so despairing, he said, no man cared for my soul. All these things, though, God is using to work together for our good and his glory. That's the great heart of our stackpole verse, Romans 8, 28, that God has a purpose for his people. Now, first of all, we are connected to him and his purpose because of God's favor toward us. As we camp out in verse 20, 31, Paul said, what then shall we say to these things? There's that term, these things. What things? All things that we experience. But far more significantly, these things are these great truths that he just spoke about God and his work for us. Predestination to be marked out in the image of Christ. We said, let's don't go to some extreme of theology, but let's realize that from the very beginning of time, God's purpose was to draw a circle around us and do everything possible to make us like Jesus Christ. And then we see His calling, His choosing of us, His justification, glorification, and we saw that it is so certain in the mind and plan of God that it, the, the past tense is even used. He has already glorified us as far as eternity is concerned. Now, I'm not talking about some weird uh, sixth dimension here, but we saw that God is in the eternal now. That it's like standing on top of, of a skyscraper in a downtown and you can see the people coming down the street here, and you can see people coming toward them over here. You know exactly, and in your peripheral vision, you see exactly what's going on. All And, and that person there is in a linear existence, but you're in a different perception, a different reality high up on that building. And so God sees and knows, and He is using all of this tremendous activity of redemption and sanctification to make us like Christ, to conform us to his plan. A farmer once went to a banker in his small town. He said to the town banker, he says, I have good news and bad news. And the banker said, well, what's the bad news first? And the farmer said, well, you know that, uh, that 10-year crop loan I'm going to have to default on that. I can't pay it back. And the mortgage in my, on my farm, I can't make that payment either. And you know those couple of hundred thousand dollars I borrowed to get some new tractors and new equipment? I can't pay that back either. And matter of fact, I'm going to have to give up the farm and turn it back over to you, the bank. And stunned, the banker said, well, what in the world is the good news? And the farmer said, the good news is, I'm going to keep banking with you. <laughs> well, the good news is great and greater and the greatest news. God, first of all, is enabler. Look at verse 28 and verse 31. He is working all things together. But look at verse 31. 
what then shall we say? Now, Paul normally would not ask that. Paul would just say it. I mean, he'd, he'd just tell it like it is. But he, he said, what then shall we say? Uh, it's a th- uh, rhetorical question. If God is for us, who is against us? There's absolutely no one and no thing that can be so against us that he can stop or she can stop or it can hinder what God has determined. The great old preacher R.G. Lee, whom, no, by the way, I heard him preach payday someday, his most famous sermon at my little church when I was a teenager. And I was overwhelmed when the pastor asked me to get up and as a 16-year-old pray after this very famous sermon. He preached it over a thousand times. R.G. Lee, though, made this statement. If you get up in the morning and start your day and don't meet the devil, that means you're both going in the same direction. I don't want to be on the devil's side, but the devil is going to throw everything he can against us. But God says, I am for you. Put your name in there. Fill in the blank. I am for you. And there is no one or no thing that matters. It doesn't matter who is against you. Sir Edmund Hillary was the first man to climb Mount Everest the world's tallest mountain. In his first attempt, a man died. He did not make it to the summit. He came home, though, a hero in England, and uh, they had a special banquet for him to honor him. There was a picture of that amazing, imposing mountain behind him on the stage, and he turned and he said to to the picture of Mount Everest, Everest, you have defeated me. But I will return and I will defeat you. You cannot get any bigger, but I can. But I can. In other words, Hillary was saying, I can go back again. I can somehow do something to climb this mountain. And most of us who have read this story know that the smartest thing he did was to enlist a Sherpa guide from Nepal who could help him know the way up the mountain. We all need others to help us, but God is that enabler. He is at work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure, the Apostle Paul said. But also Jesus is Savior. He is Savior. Look at verse 32. He did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. You, you, it's easy to pass over that verse. God did not spare Jesus the same way he spared Isaac when he asked Abraham to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice. At the last moment, God said, stop, wait. Now I know that you trust me and obey me, Abraham. You have been willing to give your only son. But we know the truth of John 3.16. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. He did not spare his son, but he delivered him up for us all. Not just for those who believe, but every single person. Christ died for the sinners and the sins of the world. And all through the scriptures, there is that all-encompassing, unlimited atonement that is only effective, though, if we believe and turn from our sins to Him. Jesus is Savior. Now, normally in the Gospels, when Christ would give the, uh, would he, he would explain something, He would begin with the lesser and go to the greater. For instance, He would say, if God so clothes the lilies of the field, And if God so takes care of the birds in the air, how much more will he take care of you? That's from the lesser to the greater. But Paul now begins with the greatest, the greater, and then argues to the lesser. If God did not spare his son, surely for you and for me who do not deserve it, he will give us all 
things that we need. Now, not everything we desire, but all that we need. His own son. You know, it's, a, it's an amazing day of gender confusion, confusion, isn't it? I was reading about a school that decided that they needed to be gender neutral instead of he and she. They changed it and they created a, a brand new pronoun, hen. Instead of he and her, H-E-N. Can you imagine uh, two hens are fighting out in the schoolyard? Uh, doesn't quite sound right, of course. And even, even in some of the toy uh, stores and toys around the world, they're, they're putting uh, in their, in their uh, advertisements little girls playing with guns and little boys carrying dolls. It's a strange world, isn't it, of confusion and rebellion against God's plan. But listen to what God said about His Son. In Isaiah 8, 4, before the boy, get that, before the boy knows how to cry, my father or my mother. And this is a prophetic messianic picture of how one day Jesus would come into the world. When the Magi came to toddler Jesus, they didn't ask Herod, where is the one born hen of the Jews? But the one born king of the Jews. And so God gave his only son for us. But then the father is also giver. He would give us all things, verse 32. Turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians. And I want to show you one of my life verses, one of my favorite verses that I claim all the time in my spiritual life. So many think of God as a taker and not a giver. But he is the greatest giver of all. And if he would give us all things that we need, all things that will work together, that we would be like Christ in his plan and his purpose, it's out of his grace. Look with me, 2 Corinthians 9, 8 and 9. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good work or every good deed. As it is written, He scattered abroad, He gave to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. Now, as you, as you may remember, I've been uh, teaching out of the New American Standard Version Bible. But you can read almost any translation and you will see all, every, all, every. All grace is abounding. All grace abound to you, all, whatever you need, so that you always having all sufficiency, literally in all things or everything, you may have an abundance for Every good deed, all good deeds the Lord desires. He makes His grace abound to us. In ancient days, when rivers dried up, when wells dried up, they would literally move. They would leave that location and go somewhere else. But the Christian never has to worry if God and His resources will dry up. But then in verses 33 and 34, we see that God is justifier. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect or God's chosen ones? This is legal language. What in the world is justification? That's a big highfalutin word, isn't it? He justifies us. Look back with me in in Romans 8. We saw that in verse 30. That when he calls us, he then calls us when we trust in him as justified. Janet and I were sharing uh, in in Tennessee this week, as I said, and my son-in-law is worship pastor of the uh, music ministry and all of that's involved in that at First Baptist Cleveland, Tennessee. And he did something and made a, a father-in-law really happy. He said, "Would you give a devotional?" To the choir. Now, 
I was exci- as excited about preaching a devotional to his choir as I would be preaching in a big church. And so I said, Lord, what do you want me to share? I, I, wanna, I want this to be meaningful. And he said, short also. A short, meaningful devotional. To me, short and meaningful are oxymorons, Grant. But anyway, uh, the Lord impressed on me to talk about grace, all grace and abounding grace. Well, anyway, uh, the Bible says, Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. And that word exceeds or surpasses is literally a river overflowing its banks in flood time. And I said the righteousness that we have that is pleasing to God is in four levels. It was first deposited for us in our account when Christ died on the cross as the perfect God-man, as the perfect sacrifice For our sins, because we are not righteous, he deposited it for us. And then it was credited to our account. And the Bible speaks about the righteousness of God that we reckon on. But then it must be appropriated by faith, where we trust his righteousness in place of our sin that can never please God. Our, our, our works are dead works, Hebrews says. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, Isaiah said. And then once it is appropriated, it is then our job to demonstrate. It must be demonstrated. In other words, we do righteousness because we are righteous in him, the Lord, our righteousness Jehovah Sidkenu, he was called in that compound name in the Old Testament, the Lord our righteousness. He has made unto us as righteousness, Paul said to the Corinthians. We then demonstrate that righteousness that we have appropriated because it was credited to us and deposited for us. We are then justified. The debt has been paid. It's, in a way, the idea of double jeopardy. One of the oldest laws in civilization and uh, affirmed in the Fifth Fifth Amendment, that you cannot be tried and convicted twice for the same crime. Once you have either been convicted or acquitted, you cannot be tried again for that crime. It's called double jeopardy, the danger of that. Jesus died in our place. Jesus provided the the payment for our sins. It is finished, he said. And therefore, we are free when we appropriate his righteousness and forgiveness. But because of the fact that Jesus is raised from the dead, verse 34, Christ is conqueror as well as justifier. In other words, if Satan, the accuser of the brethren, points a finger at you and says, you are unworthy, you are a dirty, rotten sinner, you don't deserve anything God gives to you, I don't care what the Bible says, you don't deserve it, you're unworthy. Jesus says, over my dead body, will you talk like that, Satan, because I've been raised and I'm seated at the right hand of God, the place of honor, the place of authority, Jesus is our justifier, and he is our conqueror because he conquered death. And therefore, Christ is our intercessor as well in verse 34. We saw in verse 26 and 27, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us and through us and in us. But Jesus is our advocate with the Father, First John says. Jesus is our uh, defense attorney. And therefore, John says, uh, or excuse me, Paul says, who will bring a charge against God's elect, God's chosen ones? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. And he will step up and say, Satan, you may accuse, but you have no ground of accusation. 
I have credited my righteousness to their account. And therefore, I stand on behalf of Hayes Wicker. I stand and intercede forever. And therefore, Hebrews says, as our high priest, he is forever interceding or praying for us. He's not only defending us, he is also our greatest prayer partner. Hebrews says he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. It's a great thing, isn't it, to be connected. But we're not only connected to Christ and his purpose for us because he is for us, but also because he loves us. Look at verses 35 through 39. You see, we keep ourselves in the love of Christ instead of drifting. Look at verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? One of the greatest dangers was addressed in the little letter of Jude. Jude 21, uh, Jude said, keep yourselves in the love of God. Now, if you're looking at Jude, it's very important that you begin reading Jude in the first verse. He was the brother of James, the pastor, who was also the half-brother of Jesus, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, he said. To those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Notice that word kept for Jesus. And then look at verse 21. He used the same word. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Now, isn't this great? The Lord keeps us for himself. He loves you so much, he keeps you. We went through a trial not long ago, a little trial, We couldn't find Janet's diamond ring, her wedding ring. I was pretty nice about it, wasn't I? (laughs) Just to put her on the spot. And uh, and we, we were looking everywhere. As a matter of fact, we even put up a sign at the apartment over here for a $100 reward for anybody who could find that diamond ring. And I'm sure people were laughing, saying, yeah, right, $100, and we find a diamond. We're not going to turn that in for a reward. But anyway, I just thought it might show, hey, we're serious. We really want to find this ring. You want to keep a ring, don't you? You don't want to lose a diamond ring, particularly something as meaningful as a wedding ring. Well, we found it. It was on a shelf in the apartment. It just sort of blended in. You can tell how cheap I was when we got married, when a diamond blends in to the kitchen shelf. But anyway, we didn't want to lose that diamond, that ring. Far more valuable are you to the Lord. And yet the Bible says, keep yourselves in the love of God. He's going to keep us Uh, positionally, but experientially, you can feel like you're not being kept in the love of God. You can feel Satan can so confuse you that you feel unloved. No man cared for my soul, as we said, that David lamented. No man cared for my soul. Therefore, God, you must not love me. You're mad at me. You've rejected me. Satan is a liar. He is a deceiver, a liar, and a devourer, and he does it by making us think that God doesn't still love us. He who spared not his only son, but delivered us up for it, uh, love delivered him for us, how will he not also give us all things? In other words, out of his lavish love, he will pour out on us everything that we need. But you have to keep yourself. That's why Jesus said, continue in my love. John 15, 9. 
The way we keep ourselves, the way we continue is, he said in John 15, abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Remain in me, continue in me, abide in me, look to me. Uh, Realize that I want to love through you and show my love to you. Keep yourselves in his love. Don't drift. But then we count on the love of Christ regardless of difficulty. And you see that in 35 to 37. God loves us regardless of anyone. Look at verse 35 and 36. Now he's quoting from Psalm 44, 22. That we're like sheep led to the slaughter, being put to death all day long. The, this very word that Paul uses here in verse 36, considered as sheep to be slaughtered, does not mean sacrificial lambs in ritual sacrifice in the temple. It was a word for butchering sheep for the marketplace. We're just like common sheep to be butchered by Satan, the devourer, the wolf, the lion. Pastoring in Naples, Florida, you know, for 27 years, you meet a lot of different people. And one day I had lunch with a gentleman who had grown up on the farm in Iowa, and they had sheep on the farm. And uh, this, this, this man said, we had, we had two twins of sheep, and then we had another sheep that looked just like the twins. So we named them, these, get this, Lambert Herbert and Sherbert. They gave names to these sheep, Lambert, Herbert, and Sherbert. And he said they were pets. They, they were just like a dog or a cat. And, and you know, here, Lambert, bah. he said, imagine how shocked we were one day when our mother announced we were having lamb for dinner. Herbert was for dinner. He said, we, it was really hard to take. But imagine Jesus, the lamb, led to slaughter. And so the Bible says we are just like lambs that they want to butcher. Listen, the devil is not our friend. Remember what R.G. Lee said, if you're headed in the same, if, if, you know, <laughs> you've got to decide, are you going against the grain or with the grain. And so the Bible says, even though we have people who may want to destroy us and devour us, facing death all day long, just like those early Christians who were persecuted by Rome, all day long, however, God loves us regardless. And God loves us regardless of anything as well as anyone. Look at verse 35, verses 38 and 39. Who can separate us? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? And then you see these issues, will tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? What is this all about? Tribulation uh, is strong pressure that comes against us. And there literally is another word similar to this uh, tr it, that's also translated as trouble or tribulation that had the idea of being whipped by uh, like a cat of nine tails that whipped Jesus with shards of glass and metal and leather straps that would just rip the body. That can't separate us from his love. Or distress. This is a word that uh, means hardship, both outward and inward. Persecution is being attacked for our faith. Famine is going without food and basic needs. Nakedness is having basically everything stripped away from you. You've lost everything, you think. Uh, danger, ever-present danger from all kinds of enemies and the sword, which speaks about the execution by the government, Paul was beheaded eventually. None of these things 
can separate us from the love of God. You may not experience the sword, but you do experience the pressure and the problems and the trials and the betrayals. You, I have. I've gone through times that have been so difficult, I wondered where God was. And yet all these things are still in his hands. The distress, hardship, is literally from the word that means uh, a, a, a tight place. You'll see that in some translations. And so God's love is regardless. Look at verses 38 and 39, though. And let me go back to 37. In all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. To keep that in mind, I'll speak about that in just a moment and explain that. For I am convinced, Paul said in verse 38, that neither death nor life. In other words, when we die, it may be painful. It may be uh, after a long illness. It may be in a sudden car accident or a stroke. We don't know. But in that moment when we are separated, the soul from the body, the brain waves ceasing, the heart ceasing, in that very moment, you are as loved by God as the moment you were born and when you were born again. Death nor life. You've, I, we've, we've all uh, had those questions. I'm not sure I want to go on living. I'm not sure I can take the daily grind anymore, or the loss, or the hurt, or the pain that I experience in life. No, He still loves you, and you can still overwhelmingly conquer. Angels, principalities, demons cannot separate you, no matter how powerful they are. Angels uh, are not to be worshipped nor feared. Principalities speak of organized, hier hierarchical, demonic powers. Daniel 10 speaks about the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece, and yet God's archangel is stronger than them. And as Daniel prayed, that great angel overcame. All these things, they're not working against us. They're working for us. And we are super conquerors, verse 37 says. We watched our little uh, granddaughter, who's third grade, play in her basketball tournament two or three times this week. It's really funny to watch organized little girl basketball. And uh, they, uh, well, they, they, give, they give it their best. And uh, we heard about a team that literally scored every time they touched the ball. I don't know what, if they were third graders, hard to believe. But my son-in-law, who, who is as honest and integral a man as I've ever met, said, he said, I heard they, sco they scored 92 to 2. 92. How is that possible? Every time the other team got the ball, they stole it and scored. Every time they got the ball, they scored. It's hard to believe. They were super conquerors. We're not going to win at the buzzer. We are super conquerors. And even when we go through trials, we can say, Lord, I don't feel like a conqueror. I may not look like a conqueror, but in Jesus Christ, because you love me and you have a plan for my life, I praise you, Lord, that you always lead me in your triumph in Christ Jesus. We have in our last church two friends who were part of the Cape Cod Alliance Bible Church up in Massachusetts. They got an email from their pastor. An arsonist had burned down their entire church building. At three in the morning, the fire had been set and quickly consumed the entire church building. The pastor had been preaching on Hebrews 11 and faith. And you know, the end of Hebrews 11 is that some are not delivered, some are tortured, 
Some die in horrible ways. But here's what he wrote to the church. It was our building that was destroyed, not our church. The real church of people united by faith in Christ who has conquered. He has conquered. Already, we've won. Let's pray.